Good morning, and uh, I think we're going to try and drop the lights a little bit here just so that we can get some resolution on the slides for you. What I'd like to do is take just a few minutes to describe what I think, what we think at IDA is a really important issue. And I'm going to start with the same thing that we've been talking about for two years. And we started talking about that here. Two years ago, at this event, roughly this week, this same time in, in the year, we first asked the question, what if Singapore could do something difficult and amazing, which was to try and be a smart nation, which is much more than smart city with a different word. It's something more ambitious, much more holistic. So we asked that question two years ago at this event. What I'd like to do is share with you what we believe now is the most important thing facing us when we confront some of these issues. We're making progress in Smart Nation, but I'd like to describe for you what it is that we think are things that we need to think about. So picking up where Mark was, there are some questions that we need to be asking. And there's some things that we need to talk about. And we need to talk about those openly, and we need to ask questions and have a good discussion on them. And so that's part of the goal that I have in the next 10, 12 minutes with you. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation that we're trying to have through social media, we're at, on Twitter, IDASG. I'm at Steve Leonard SG. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure Hari will talk about that more himself as he comes up. But we'd like to be engaged with many of you. So if you have a point of view, you have something to offer which helps us move the discussion forward, we'd like to do that. So we said, what if we could be a smart nation? So we've got things like headline news, right? Singapore's number one in this, number one in that, number one in maths and sciences scores for 15-year-olds. We're number one in global inf information technology readiness, according to the World Economic Forum, in terms of our ability to use technology because we're already a highly networked, highly tech-savvy community, as in Singapore. We're ranking very highly in a lot of these different areas. So you might think that that's what we correlate back to being a smart nation. But what I'm going to do is take a different tack and say, OK, yep, we are proud to be number one. We do look at these seriously because they're benchmarks, and we have to be sensitive to benchmarks. But we're going to start off with, that's great, but so what? So now the question for us is, where do we take this? Are we working on big problems? Are we working on important problems? Are we doing things that will affect Singapore and many other countries around the world? So I love this picture for several reasons. One is the gentleman looks like he's cranky about something, unhappy about something. So I just like the, fi the picture here. But we have an aging population, and that's no different than other countries around the world. You may have seen some of these numbers, but let me just highlight a few. So roughly 900,000 citizens above the age of 65 in Singapore in the next 15 years or so. Now that's a big dynamic, and it means that there are basically two working adults for every one elderly person. Today it's roughly one in five. Some years ago it was one in seven. So you can see clearly the compression. And so this means that there's a lot of extra strain on the system. Fewer working people supporting more older people. But here's a couple of important statistics. On both of these two metrics, the number of citizens living alone and those that have some sort of memory issue, dementia, Alzheimer's, that is going to be roughly 10% based on some estimates of the population above this age group or in this age group. Now that's a really important issue, especially if you take those two circles and put them together. How many citizens may have some form of dementia and are living alone. That's a big, scary thing. So what we need to do now is say, how can technology help? And so I show this as an example of one startup that's working on something. It's an organization called Proteus, which is working on embedding a sensor in tablets, in pills. So sensors are so small at scale that they would be in each tablet, and as you take your medication, there's a way of saying, I'm in the body, I've been taken. So you wear a patch on the outside of your body and a signal is sent that says, I'm on board. Now some people say, that sounds scary. Why would I want to do that? 
that seems uncomfortable to me? And the answer is because we know that 50% of people that have medication don't take it regularly or in compliance with what they need to do in order for the medication to be effective. So here's the question. Do you more highly prize the issue of non-compliance leading to other forms of recurring disease, or can you get over the fact that something this microscopic would be in a tablet? I don't know. It's for you to decide. But for me, I'd rather know that the people around me that I care about are taking the medications, especially if they need some extra help. So everybody's going to have to start thinking about how this evolving world looks. But Technology can do a lot of things. We can go into a whole new discussion about autonomous vehicles, and autonomous vehicles sounds scary, and what happens if it runs over someone's cat? And the answer is, that would be a shame, but it happens every day with people driving cars. So are we scared of autonomous vehicles because something might happen? Or do we think about those as giving us a significantly new capability to move from A to B in a way that current traffic patterns may not allow in another five or 10 or 20 years. Question, right? Technology can do a lot of things. Are we ready? So let me touch on something that I hear a lot and I feel compelled to try and speak to it. One is people say to me a lot of times, hey, IDA is also a regulator. Mark posed the question, regulate what? But the idea is, is innovation somehow at odds with policy? So I'll come out, now maybe I'm biased, but I'll come out and say, to me, policy gives a framework against which innovation can also meaningfully, thoughtfully occur. If we say innovation means it's free and easy, wild west, everybody do what they want, we'll see how many cool things can happen, I think there's a counter argument that says, well, that also can lead to a lot of unhelpful, unintended consequences. So I think it's good to argue is the policy right for the era? So a lot of data protection, a lot of data movement was thought of in a printed world way. Now that's changed. So we have to continuously look at the policies and the regulations and the legislation. Not just Singapore, but everybody in the world. But the question is, innovation cannot be thought of as an enemy or in conflict with policy. Policy gives a structure. Now you might argue, yes, but Uber pushed faster or Airbnb pushed faster. And the answer is, that's great. Sometimes policy has to evolve to catch up, but it doesn't mean that those have to be enemies of each other. Here's the reason why. Because if you take a look at how transportation has evolved, you can get from the UK to Singapore by ship, and that'll take a long time, and some people may not make the journey, may not arrive at all and there's a lot of risk along the way. Then you have Orville and Wilbur Wright that say, well, maybe we can do this another way, so they experiment with flight. And I was reminded, together with the team last night, that it was basically 65 years or so between the time that there was the first 12, 15-second flight off the ground in the early 1900s until Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. So if you want to talk about a pretty significant rate of experimentation and growth to go from the middle picture onto a lunar landing in 60-something years, that's pretty amazing. A huge amount of experimentation. Now, the only point is I came back from the UK last week and got on a plane in London, landed here 12 hours and 45 minutes later, like I'm sure a lot of you have. So the question is, on the left, how many weeks or months? On the far right, half a day. So a lot of experimentation leads to that kind of progress. But the point that I want to stress is experimentation, accepting some risk, accepting some unknowns, making sure that there's appropriate learnings when things go wrong, and yes, policy and some rules. You wouldn't want to get on a plane without CAA or FAA and others paying a lot of attention to these issues. Now here's a big point. Inertia is very difficult to overcome. So my friend Selwyn, the physics, gentlemen sitting in the back part of the room will know that things that are in motion stay in motion or not in motion stay not in motion unless there's forces. A lot of people think of innovation as something which is a 10% improvement or a 15% improvement. And that may be the case, 
but it's very difficult to overcome inertia, which is if a company is doing something or if a person is doing something, it has to be a very significant level of improvement before a change can be adopted and kept in a meaningful way. So for everybody that likes to talk about food programs and you've got the paleo program or you've got the Atkins program or whatever, a lot of these things are great for a few weeks or maybe more if you're really disciplined and then you fall off because habits are hard and inertia is difficult to overcome. So one of the things that I'd like to stress in this morning's discussion is if we're going to do something, let's do it big. Let's not do something 5% better, let's do something meaningfully better. So inertia is hard to overcome. So that's why it has to be an order of magnitude, for example, 10x better, 10 times cheaper, 10 times faster, not generally making sure that it's 20% better or 20% cheaper. Because for everybody in the room that likes or doesn't like their bank, I guarantee that the idea of changing gyros and changing credit cards and changing all the different things that you do in order to have a slightly better offer from a competing bank is not something you'll, you'll accept, even if you feel unhappy somewhat with your current provider. It's just too hard. Here's one of the things that we're asking everybody that we're working with at IDA to be thinking about. And I'd ask that of all of you, all of you that are parents in the room, all of you that are teachers, or all of you that run companies, whatever role you have, I really like these three words. Because anybody that's moved anything forward over the course of human history has some of these three characteristics or attributes. You have to be curious about something. What if it goes this other way? You have to be courageous. I'm going to step into the unknown. For the guys that sailed into the blue ocean, no idea whether they actually would fall off the edge or not. Because there was a whole room full of people that said, that's as far as it goes. And they said, I don't know, I don't think so. Let me see what happens. And you need to obviously be confident because if it doesn't work out, you can't go home and feel sad. You have to say, well, that didn't work out. I'm gonna try it this other way. So everybody that's ever done anything that we can all remember generally has some combination. You can see from the picture that we're trying to encourage young kids because this isn't a discussion at 23, this is a discussion at five and six and eight years old. Okay, Jaron, who's sitting over in the front row to your left here, or to my left. So Jaron, who's uh, been working with us in IDA Labs, and I wanted to tell his story briefly because here's why I like it. So Jaron had an assignment from SUTD to build a spherical robot. And there was a couple of different ways to think about this. I can build a spherical robot, I can get a score, it will do whatever it is that I ask it to do, and that's generally the end of the assignment, and then I can move on. But Jaron said, hey, let me see if there's a way to try and make it useful. So I'd like to see if there's real problems that it can solve. I'd like to see if somebody actually can put it to use. Does somebody have a need that I can try and help address? So worked on what is now called a salamander, but the thing that I wanted to share with you is there was learnings along the way. And so the elasticity of the treads that surround it, because he wanted to make it amphibious, so had to think about how to gain traction in the water. So how do I put some treads on the outside? The different temperatures cause the elasticity of the material to change, so I have now a grip problem or an adhesion problem. Needed to think about the weights in order to know whether it was properly buoyant, neutrally buoyant, was it something that would sink or was it not getting enough traction unless it was crystally clear and smooth water? And at the same time, how do I think about making it watertight because it's clearly meant to be amphibious. So if there's water, that's going to kill the robot. So I had to think about all the different points was what Jared, Jared was thinking about. And the scenario that was one of the use cases was if there's mangroves around Singapore and we need to understand the health of those and what's happening with pollution effects and shoreline erosion and so on, maybe this could get into places that others could not. Is this a way of solving a need that the Maritime Authority and others within Singapore would have and could I put this into something which is a real use? So the reason that I want to share this is that Jaron spent time thinking about what was just an assignment and thought, how can I make it something more useful? And so he worked with some of the different teams and is now spending time with us at IDA Labs because we like curious and courageous and confident people. And we need lots 
of people like Charon. So thank you very much, Charon, for your hard work and for your innovation. We hope that we'll continue to do more things. Charon, wave your hand so everybody knows who you are. Charon, wave your hand. There he is. <laughs> OK. I wasn't just pointing to an imaginary person. There we go. All right. So here's another scenario, is keep experimenting. Now, we don't generally use the expression. Some people like to do fail fast. Sometimes we use it. But we like the idea of learn, learn, as opposed to embedding the word fail. So if we fail, we pick up, we learn, and we keep going. So we love this picture because building drones, experimenting, we had a demo, just to be very transparent, we had a demo yesterday downstairs for the ministerial forum at IDA Labs in which a drone didn't work exactly as planned. And the answer is, that's what happens sometimes. We don't go home in shame. The answer is, that's what happens sometimes. Keep working. But the message here is it's not only for young kids. So at an event that we had a couple of weeks ago at SunTech, where we had 10,000 people show up, Tech Saturday, we ended up having a lot of people experimenting and curious. So I love this picture, which is everybody has an opportunity to experiment and learn something new and different. So love this idea. Keep experimenting. Keep learning. Technology is not something to be feared. Technology is something that as we understand more about it and learn more about it, we can use it in new ways. Fire is a technology, controlling fire. When, when people built a campfire, that was controlling an outcome. That's technology. Antibiotics are technology. Water purification is technology. Electricity is technology. So when people say, you know, technology can be scary, or it's not about the technology, it's about the people, the answer is, that's great, but technology is all around us. So let's talk about it. Let's not be afraid of it. Smart nation, hashtag, smart nation needs coders, but we also need a lot of these. So this is another key message that I'd like to share with you. For sure, any great company that I've ever seen built or worked for or great companies that we're trying to help build now, if we just obsess about needing more coders, we're not going to build great companies. We need great technologists and great coders, yes. And we need people that understand financial engineering, how to get loans and pay cash flow bills on time, et cetera. And we need HR to build talent. We need lots of different skills. So smart nation needs a lot of different skills. If you're in technology, great. If you are a coder, great. But if you know things about other areas of expertise and you can help add that knowledge to a team, great. So one of the messages is we need a lot of skills in order to build a smart nation. Like this, representative faces of people that we've worked with, people that we still work with. These are the kinds of people that are going to build Singapore into a smart nation and ideally help other countries as well tackle important challenges. So two years ago on this stage, I showed this very slide and I wanted to reminisce for a second and show it again. And the whole question was, how did we go from the Earth to the moon when there was no idea what would happen as soon as somebody left orbit? If you look back into the archives at all of NASA, there was questions, will the guy's eyeballs pop out? Will he be able to swallow any liquid? There's black and white footage of one of the early astronaut pioneers drinking juice as he orbits the Earth because scientists weren't sure whether having lack of gravity would mean that you couldn't swallow anything. So that's how little we knew, and yet within a relatively short period of time, the lunar module landed on the moon. And again, to repeat that very story, the software behind the lunar landing program was largely built by an MIT graduate student team, not by 47-year-old highly experienced engineers, but by early 20-somethings, enthusiastic, excited people. So that's the question. Here's where we wanted to ask the question. Everybody starts off in a lot of meetings that I have, what if it doesn't work? So that's why we put this, what if it does? What if a Navy runs over a cat? 
I don't know. We'll have to figure that out. Just like we figured it out when there was automobiles driven by human beings. But what if it does? What if we can improve medical care? What if we can improve transportation? What if we can improve food scarcity issues, energy management issues, water safety issues? These are real issues that are affecting the whole world, and everybody likes to start with, what if it doesn't work? Very few people say, what if it does? And what problems do we need to solve? So yes, there are problems. What do we need to do to solve those? When these guys went to the moon, they didn't say, what if it doesn't work, as much as we need to make sure we get home safely. What are the issues we have to confront and solve? And yes, there's an element of what if it doesn't work. But we're going to go for it. We're going to try it. And huge numbers of inventions and innovations were unlocked along the way. So what I'd like to leave you with is Singapore aspires to be a smart nation. But in order to do that, it's not about whether we have this tech or that tech, because a lot of the tech is there. It's either in the universities or it's in the research institutes or in the startups. But here's the summary. Singapore, with all of the raw materials that it has, has the opportunity to tackle important world challenges. But we have to be ready to accept some experimentation, accept some uncertainty, accept that there is going to be bumps in the road. It's not a straight line. So if you can do anything to be of help, it's to say, what if it works? Help us, please, be in the crowd that says, yep, fair point, but what if it works? Thanks very much.